Isaiah chapter number 26. Isaiah chapter number 26 tonight. Perfect peace, which is exactly what we don't have in America. Right now going on, uh, we don't have peace. There's not a lot of peace that's going on, I'll, I'll tell you. In fact, in fact, a lot of unrest, which is the opposite of what this message is all about. Isaiah chapter number 26 and verses 3 and 4 is going to be our key verses tonight, and I want you to, uh, I want you to see these. The Bible says in Isaiah 26 and verse number 3, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed upon thee. Verse 4, Trust ye in the Lord forever. For in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Father in heaven, help us tonight as we see this important, important, important doctrine of perfect peace and how that we can have it. And there's a lot of Christians that don't have perfect peace uh, because they've allowed, they've allowed other things to enter in and rob them of their trusting of the Lord. So Father, help us tonight uh, to trust you and to know what this really is and how it can be in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. You know, every single one of us go through times where there are trials, there are temptations, there are, are various different things that, that come our way. Um, uh, coming up uh, August 1st, I'm going to be doing uh, the memorial service for one of our former members, uh, Aaron Leba. And uh, I know there's going to be tears, there's going to be, you know, people are, are grieving, and all of that is, is things that Christians go through. And, uh, and if we're not careful, what happens is uh, we get focused on those things instead of getting focused on the Lord. Instead of allowing our, our, our minds to be stayed on the Lord. What does that really mean? Let me, let me just help you with that a little bit because sometimes we read these things, whose mind is stayed upon thee. You know, uh, just recently I, I reminded somebody, hey, what has God done for you? What has God done for you? Just, just, just stop for a minute and just go back in your mind. Just, just allow your mind to kind of drift back and, and think about the Lord. What has the Lord done for you? What prayer has God answered, maybe just even recently? What provision has God made for you? Man, I, I, I tell you, um, it doesn't take a Christian very long if they will sit down and just kind of meditate on that thought for a moment to say, you know, yeah, God answered this prayer and, and God did this for me. You know, listen, I don't have to have a show of hands to, to know that everybody in this room, you've had, God, you've had God do things for you you didn't even pray for. And if we would just stop and just let our minds be stayed on the Lord instead of getting carried away in the various different troubles that, that come to every human being on this planet. And Christians are not immune to that. Well, this is a dark time. Isaiah 26, it's a dark time for Israel. I mean, it's a, it's a time where where in the history of Israel, where they're not exactly where they need to be. And, um, and you know, we don't need these kinds of, or we don't really depend on these kind of verses when we're on the mountaintop and the sun's shining. And everything's hunky-dory. By the way, 
That's the most dangerous time for the Christian is when everything is going great because that's when the prayer life begins to slip. It's true. It's when you and I get under the circumstances, all of a sudden our prayer life comes back alive. Well, it shouldn't be the case, but it is the case oftentimes with, with all of us. And, uh, and it was this, play, this case with, with uh, Israel during this time. I want to remind you that there's not a promise in the Bible that says that we're going to be free of troubles. We're going to be facing troubles. Job said this. Others said this throughout the Bible. We're going to be facing troubles all of our life until Jesus takes us home. In fact, I've often thought that, you know, if everything was just absolutely just tremendous here, then heaven might not be as special as we know that it's going to be. Sometimes it's because we're going through the circumstances that you and I make statements like this. Boy, I wish the Lord had come back. You know, boy, I wonder, when, when, when's the Lord coming back? I had a phone call from one of my sisters and, and I picked it up, said hello, and, and she said, hello, brother, when's the Lord coming back? <laughs> I said, well, in about two minutes. And she just, you know, but the truth of the matter is, it could be just, I mean, it's imminent. It's, it's right upon us. We see the signs of the times. At least we think we see the signs of the times. We're seeing a lot of things come to pass that we see that are going to transpire in the tribulation. So we know we, listen, but we've been in the perilous last days of 2 Timothy 3 for 2,000 years. Since the crucifixion of Christ, we've been in the last days. But uh, Peter said a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. So if, if, that were even, if that were even remotely close, then of course the Lord's only been gone for two days. So <clears throat> when's the Lord coming back? I think the Lord's coming back very soon. I do. I think we're in the last moments of the last days. But you know, until the Lord takes us home, guess what? We're going to have problems. We're going to have problems. Don't raise your hand. Don't say, oh my. Don't say, amen. But how many got up this morning and the very first thing you felt was an ache? And some of you young folks would, would say amen to that too. You know, man, yeah. You know, um, I was teasing somebody here just recently, and I said, how old are you? And they said, 33. I said, you see these shoes? They're older than you. <laughs> I said, man, when I was 33, I was still jumping over, I was jumping over buildings. I was chasing bullets and catching them. And I, I mean, <laughs> you know, joking. And I said, 33. And the reason why the topic came up is because, because um, um, this, indiv- this person said, you know, made a comment about, man, I'm so tired. Really? I don't even think I slept when I was 33. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's just one of those things, you know. But we are going to have things that are going to try us. And, and they're going to challenge us. And if we get focused on those things, then we're not going to have our mind stayed on the Lord. And it's when we're going through something. It's when we're facing the cancer diagnosis. It's when we're facing the, the job loss. It's when we're facing the bills that it, we can't seem to get caught up on. It, it's when we're fa- And just name whatever you want to name. It's when we're facing those things that we need to have our minds stayed on the Lord. And that's when we need to trust the Lord according to verse 4 as well. So God has said, Thou will keep him in perfect 
peace. Perfect peace. So, number one, what kind of peace is this? I mean, what kind of peace is perfect peace? We think, possibly, if we didn't study the Word, we would think, well, man, I'm hearing of wars and rumors of wars, and I'm hearing about all this turmoil, and, and even in America, we've got, we've got cities where, you know, there's shootings every single day, and uh, man, when's the perfect peace going to show up? That's not what it's talking about. That's not what it's talking about. In Matthew chapter 11, we get a little glimpse here. In verse 28 and 29, it says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is Jesus speaking. Verse 29, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart. And notice this last phrase, and ye shall find rest for your souls. That's, that's a little glimmer into what this peace is. The Hebrew word for the English word peace is the word shalom. And it carries with it the idea of spiritual peace. Now, in the soul that is filled with peace, there is no room for these things. And these are the things that battle to take away our peace. Jealousy. Envy. Discontentment. Temper. Selfishness. Pride, of course, which is probably the root of all of these. Intolerance. Crit harsh criticism. Those things rob our peace. They rob our peace. In fact, every single one of those and probably a whole list of more, those things stir us up. Those rob us of a night's good night's sleep. They, they rob us probably of several good night's sleeps, good nights of sleep. We can think all is spiritually fine when in fact it really isn't true in our lives. We, you, only you know, only I know what's going on with me. God knows too. But Satan can blind the minds of people even when it comes to, to uh, uh, especially those who, who need to be saved. Who in their own minds think they're okay. They think they're fine. And so Satan blinds their minds and they think that all is well. And by the way, Satan can deceive Christians he can deceive Christians and make them say to themselves well I, I'm fine I, I'm fine I read my Bible well is, really is that all there is to the Christian life is just read your Bible how about be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own self The sum total of Christianity is not read my Bible. Now, obviously, we need to read and study our Bibles. Amen? But Satan can even deceive the Christian. We can become self-deceived into thinking, I'm A-OK, -okay, when I'm not really A-OK. -okay. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, interesting two verses here, beginning verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God, little g, of this world, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God,
should shine unto them. So Satan can blind a lost person. And what is the blindness? Well, you witness to him. I mean, listen, if you have been a Christian for very long, then possibly you've experienced this if you're witnessing to someone and uh, and you're trying to, listen, you, you, you have to get them lost before you can get them saved. And so you're trying to share their, their, their spiritual need with them and you get responses like, I'm fine. I'm fine. You know, I've gone to church all my life. And, you know, any number of excuses. And what's happened? Satan has blinded their minds to the place where they don't see that they have a need. And it's, and it's, and by the way, when you were lost, you were blind to it as well. You were blind to it as well. You were blind to your own lost condition until you heard a message or you read a gospel track or somebody shared a passage of scripture with you or a camp counselor talked to you, you know, in Bible camp or a revival meeting or a missions conference or whatever it is or a best friend or a coworker. But you were blind to your need until all of a sudden God shined the light and instead of going along with the blindness that Satan can, can put on people, we allow ourselves to hear and listen and the Holy Spirit of God begins to work. Are you listening to me? I was thinking, I was thinking honestly about my own situation. And there was a, a man, as far as I know, he's lost. He's still lost. We were best friends. I mean, we did virtually everything together. And uh, and and I I, I got to kind of thinking. I, I I pulled the curtain back a little bit, and I was kind of thinking about in the past. And I was thinking, man, how is it that out of this group that I was in and this world that I was evolving in, how is it that all of a sudden I got plucked out of this thing and set over here? And all I can say, you know, in fact, Pastor Illich really probably answered the question for me. Because I asked him one time, I said, listen, why did you keep coming back to me? And he said, because you never shut the door. You never shut the door. So... Maybe, maybe that was it. I, I know within me, the Holy Spirit of God had gotten a hold of me. And despite all of the other stuff in my life, as bad as that was, I didn't want to go to hell. And I didn't know for sure I was going to heaven. But I was pretty sure Nobody like me was going. So the Holy Spirit of God was at work. But Satan is also at work. The Holy Spirit of God's at work. Satan is also at work. Satan can give people a false peace. That's what they, listen, all the cults and isms, asms, and spasms that are all over the world, some of those people are very, very devoted. Amen? I mean, you, you understand what I'm saying? How is it that they're operating? I'll tell you how they're operating. They're operating on a false peace. Not perfect peace, false peace. 
They're dependent on something that isn't real. And they're, or they're following some person that isn't real. And they have a false peace. That thing or that person, when they're gone, that peace is gone. God's perfect peace is completely dependent on God, not man. It's not dependent on Pastor Randall. It's not dependent on anybody else that you can think of that's a Christian. It is completely dependent upon God Almighty. And that's why we, our minds have to stay on Him. That's why we have to be, that's why we've got to bring ourselves back to what has the Lord done for me? And remind ourselves because we're fickle as pickles. God's perfect peace, by the way, lasts. It lasts. It endures. Notice chapter 26 and verse 3 again. Thou will keep him. It's God who keeps us. Amen? It's, it's God who keeps us. Gary Randall can't keep himself. I don't have the ability to do that. Eternal security is, is all in God's hand. I didn't deserve to be saved. <laughs> Why would I ever, ever think for a minute that I, would, that I deserved to be saved? Not true. At last, God will keep us, and then God's peace protects us. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, very familiar passage, it says, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You know, I've had, I've had scores of people who were drunks and drug addicts that have asked me over the years, Pastor Randall, how in the world did it happen for you? And I, I, I don't have any program, 12-step, this, that, or the other thing to tell them or point them to, I point them to Jesus. And I tell them, listen, it's a choice you're making. Make a different choice. I, I chose, and God saw my heart, I meant business, and God, I need you, and you got to do something right now, and it's got to be on the realm of the miraculous, or I'm going to be in serious trouble. And there are a lot of people that play games with this. Oh God, I really want you to... And they don't really want it. They don't really want it. I quit, listen, I quit drugs a hundred times before I quit drugs. Because a hundred times I was playing games. But then the Holy Spirit of God got a hold of me and I realized, man, I'm breaking Jesus' heart. This, I'm, I'm, I'm involved in this sin that, is, that put Him on the cross and it broke me. And I wept and cried and begged God to deliver me. And guess what? God did. God has the ability to do that. God doesn't play games. When we get serious with God, God gets serious with us. Well, you know, what am I saying? I'm saying that, listen, God protects us. And I was a Christian. And I was in trouble. And my, my heart was broken. And my mind was confused. And God said, listen, I am going to keep your heart and your mind, Gary Randall. And I'm going to show you what the peace of God looks like. And when I woke up the next morning, I not only didn't have one single second of miserable, stinking withdrawal that I should have had, I never had one millisecond of withdrawal. And 
even, even more importantly than that, I have never since that day ever had a desire for drugs ever again. I mean, God not only delivered, but he took it all away. And man, I'm telling you something. So, you had no more temptations. I didn't say that. I had people all around me using drugs. Choices. 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 That's why my life's verse, you'll find it in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. That verse delivered me. I wasn't reading hardly any place else in the Bible but that verse. And boy, I'll tell you something. Well, you don't need to have 31,105 verses. One will do. One will do. Choices. Choices. So, secondly, I want to just bring out, how, how do we get this peace? How do we get this peace? Well, again, Philippians 4, 7, look at it. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding. Forget about trying to figure it out. Forget about trying to figure out my testimony. I can't even figure out my testimony. I don't know how God did it. All I know is God did it. By the way, that's kind of the thing with tithing. Especially in higher inflation. Okay? <laughs> All of a sudden, all of a sudden, the dollar isn't going as far as it used to go. So I, I, I tithe, by the way, and it's not just tithing, it's tithes and offerings. And so it's above the 10%. And that's 10% of the gross, not 10% of the net. That's 10% of the first fruits, not 10% of the middle fruits or the last fruits. How in the world can anybody survive giving away that and expecting to make it when, when pastor, the truth of the matter is, is prior to me even attempting to do this, I wasn't getting by on the 100%. And here's my answer to you. Forget about a pencil and paper. You're never going to figure it out. Put God first. Make, make that tithe the very first thing. Not the last thing. Make that tithe the very first thing. And that tithe plus God's provision will provide more for you than your 100% ever dreamed about taking care of. And you say, that doesn't make any sense. Well, then you figure out God. You figure out God. Because, dear friend, there are some things. The peace that God can bring and how God provides passes all understanding. Forget about it. You're, you're not going to figure it out. You're not going to figure it out until you step out by faith and trust God, you're never going to see the hand of God work in your life, ever. God says, I will, I will keep your hearts and minds. How? How do I get this peace? It's through Christ Jesus. Through the Lord. This begins at salvation, but it doesn't end there. In Romans chapter 5 and verse number 1, the Bible declares, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's our salvation. The peace that is given through saving faith, He obtained it for us. And we can never know the peace of God, and get this, the peace of God, 
until we have peace with God. I'm sorry to tell you this, but I've run into a lot of Christians in my Christian life, 40 plus years, 45 years. And I've run into a lot of Christians mad at God. Mad at God. For what, it doesn't matter what the circumstance. Mad at God. And I, I'm going to tell you right now, you're never going to have the peace of God until you have peace with God. Until you understand that God's not the enemy. Until you understand that God wants the very best for you and me. Until we understand that, we're never going to we're never going to really have the peace of God at all. Because we're at odds with God. And maybe that's on again and off again and on again and off again. But dear friend, that's the way it is. A true Christian can know the peace of God when they trust God and let God be God. Well, there's some things that we go through, and I mentioned it in the very beginning. There's trials, there's all kinds of difficulties, troubles, various different things. Listen, but God is still God, and he still loves us. And God's still going to watch out for us, and he's never left us, and he's never forsaken us. And by the way, as you get older, and young people listen to me, as you get older, this is going to become even more vital. And you are getting older. And you have to, we, we run into, listen, physical problems are some of the greatest difficulties that people have to deal with in order to have the peace of God. It has to be given over to the Lord. It has to be given over to the Lord. It, what, did verse, what did verse 4 say? Trust ye in the Lord forever. It has to be given over. And when we do this, we know the peace that God can give. Are we going to be perfect? Not in this life. Are we going to struggle on again, off again, on occasion, on these things that I'm talking about right now? Yes. But we've got to come back to the truth. We've got to come back to what is my knowledge of God? There's something in 2 Corinthians 10 that talked about casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. Do you know what Satan does in the midst of our trouble, in the midst of our difficulty, the trial that we go through, whatever it happens to be? Satan, Satan whispers in the ear of the Christian and says, God doesn't care. God doesn't love you. God doesn't care. And God's not going to deliver you. And God's not going to do anything for you. And then He's going to accuse you because you're this, 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 and this, and this. And my dear friend, if you don't cast down those thoughts, and by the way, it... it <laughs> I can tell you as a gospel preacher, the biggest battle I, I fight is up here. And I fight that battle a hundred times a day. And that's on a light day. Those thoughts that come in that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. What do you really know about God? Well, let me just give you one thing. God loves you so much. He loves you so much. He sacrificed 
His only begotten Son. And I want to ask you parents, who do you love in this world so much that you would sacrifice your children? Hello? There isn't one parent in here that would sacrifice their child intentionally. God did it intentionally. Why? Because he loved Gary Randall. And if Gary Randall had been the only sinner on planet Earth, he would have sent his son to die for Gary Randall. So what do you know about God? Well, if you don't know anything else, my friend, know John 3.16. That he loves you that much. And if he loves you that much, don't you think he cares about the problem you're going through? Don't you think he cares about the difficulty that you're facing? Don't you think he cares about the temptations that come your way? Don't you think he cares about that? Don't you think he knows that? So you can trust him. And if we trust him, then we're going to have perfect peace. We're going to have perfect peace. That perfect peace, it comes by Jesus Christ. It also comes by the Holy Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, on and on and on. The fruit of the Holy Spirit. And it also comes by His Word. Psalm 119, verse 165. Great, say it, great peace have they which love Thy law. And nothing shall offend them. Nothing? God says nothing. God says great peace. See, if you love the Word of God, then you know what the Word of God says because you spend time in the Word of God. You love the Word of God. You apply the Word of God. You do the Word of God. And great peace have they that love thy law and nothing shall offend them. Jesus wasn't offended on the cross. Why should we be offended? But we get offended, don't we? We get offended. There's not a person in this room that at one time or another you weren't offended and probably multiple times. But great peace have they because the word brings that. And lastly, I want you to see that there's conditions of peace. You see Philippians 4 and verse 6 and 7 The Bible says, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Then verse 7, as we've seen before, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. We don't get verse 7 if we don't do verse 6. We don't get it. The promises of of verse 7 are predicated by verse 6. And notice that our requests are made known to God with thanksgiving. Now, you know, listen, typically in, in our interaction with people, somebody does something for us and we say, thank you. In this particular case, we're exercising our faith in God because we are, instead of worrying, instead of being careful or being anxious about something and getting all worried and wrought up, and what, by the way, what has that ever done? What, what, how has that ever made anything better? Never has. 
But we get all we get all worried. God says to be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication, prayer and continued prayer with thanksgiving. Thanking God in advance for something that hasn't even been answered yet. Hello? Does that sound familiar? That sounds familiar to me, Brother Chris. What is that verse? Hebrews 11.1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. In everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, thanking in advance. You put your prayer out there, and you continue to pray. And you continue to petition God for that which, which you desire. And you're thanking God. And thank you, God, for hearing me. And thank you, God, because I'm going to trust you that all things work together for good to them who love God, to them who are the called according to your, pur- to, to your purpose. Thank you, God, for hearing me. Thank you, God, that I have my petitions that I have, that, that I have before you. Thank you for answering this prayer, Lord. And you haven't even got the answer yet. This is not some magical thing. This is real bona fide trust in God. Now, it's so easy to say, well, I'm trusting the Lord, really. And I hope you are. But it's so easy to say. It's so easy to say. Perfect peace, perfect peace is in the Lord. And we trust Him. And we thank Him. And we worship Him. And we obey Him. Because we trust Him. The song said, Stayed upon Jehovah, hearts are fully blessed. Finding, as he promised, perfect peace and rest. We need perfect peace. In a world that's filled with turmoil, you and I ought to be the shining lights out here. You and I ought to be the shining lights at at work, at school, at whatever it is. And people ought to look and say, man, you don't look like you're bothered by anything. You say, well, I've got the Lord. The Lord's taking care of me. Let me tell you what the Lord's done for me. And you know what? It's in a climate like this where I think that when, when we maybe get into a dialogue like that with somebody, that we might be able to share Jesus with them and they might be able to get saved. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Amen? Well, perfect peace. I hope it's been profitable for you to come tonight. I hope it's made you think. It sure has made me think. Oh, listen, don't go away from here saying, boy, I sure wish I had this perfectly okay like Pastor Randall's. I have, to, I have to keep this in my memory as well. Father in heaven, I just pray and ask that God you would just bless this, your word.